Sure. Uh, I'm, hi, everyone. I'm Simon Chow. Uh, I'm from Animal Booker Brands. So basically, we are a smartphone game developer who focus on developing kids and casual games. Uh, so far, we have around uh, 800 games and more than 500 million downloads across our network. And we are also quite experienced in dealing with uh, IP as well. So, so far, we have licensed more than 20 different IPs. And in the West, for example, we are working with uh, Mattel, DreamWorks, and Garfield. And uh, in the East, we are actually working with a lot of uh, Japanese anime uh, IP as well. Like, for example, Doraemon, and Kriyan Sin Chang, and Jimmy Malko. So I'm great honored to be invited here, here on the stage so that I can share with you a few things we have learned from my experience. Thank you. Jay? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jay Alipio, uh, Director for Disney Interactive in Southeast Asia. I manage uh, all of the interactive products, uh, that's games, applications, uh, across platforms, so whether if it's mobile, online, console, PC, cloud, etc. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sharizan. I am the brand head for Nickelodeon. I looked after all areas of uh, Nickelodeon business in the region. Uh, and I have been in, uh, I guess, in the content, content space and the kids space for quite some time. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nicole Seymour, and uh, like uh, Zan and Jay, I come from big broadcasters like BBC and Disney. And now I'm working on the other side of the fence, and I'm working for a small startup independent production company based in London, Paca Alpaca. And it's very challenging creating a brand from scratch in this very uh, busy space. Uh, so Paca Alpaca is our flagship brand, and uh, we're all about first words in different languages for preschoolers set in a playful cultural context. And so far we've published a few apps, we have an official channel on YouTube, and we are also launching on children's SVOD platforms around the world, and also pursuing the educational sector in emerging markets, and uh, yeah, just figuring out how to monetize while we build the brand. So very different uh, speakers from uh Completely different backgrounds. I think we've got some large companies. We have, uh, you know, a, a, a new initiative, a, a smaller company doing well. Um, what are I'm mean, like? We're talking about kids, you know, building apps for children today. I mean, uh, you know, there is there is a lot of competition in that space already. So, what are some of the models for monetization, or what are the some of the business models that work in this space? I think that's one of the first questions, uh, and I'm sure I think we can get some different perspectives because I think all of you do this slightly differently from each other. So what are some of the main ways in which you can monetize um, an app for, um, for kids? So who would like to go first? Um, I can throw some ideas around okay. to get this started. So basically, um, in terms of monetizing kids' game, there are several ways. So first of all, we have freemium, we have premium, we have advertising and also subscription models. <laughs> so when it comes to, for us, actually, we adopt the subscription models more than the other ones. And the reason behind it is, um, to us, actually, female models, actually, although it has been proven extremely successful in the other generic game market, but then when it comes to kids, actually, we think um, the kids doesn't have a credit card themselves. So whenever they want to make a payment, they have to get permission from their parents, which most of the time, their parents doesn't want their kids to play a lot of kids' game, which hinder the uh, uh, upgrade and also pay user ratios. And for advertising, actually, because of copper and EDRP, so actually, there's also something limiting the financial potential as well. And to us, actually, subscriptions are best way because uh, it allow us to enjoy a repeat purchase from the players with uh, minimum uh, frictions. So that actually once we subscribe to the products, you actually enjoy the benefits or long tail revenue. Okay. So this is, a, this is a common problem. I'm like, uh, whether it's the bigger companies or the smaller companies, I'm like, uh, the fact that the kids don't have credit cards is, is, is a major issue. Um, so I would like to ask Disney this first, <laughs> Jay. What does, uh, do, you, do you really, I mean, like, have you seen, like Club Penguin, I know it was uh, one of your properties uh, that had a subscription model. Uh, is subscription something that's still big in, uh, in this space today? I, I think the, the key thing when looking into the space is really not just which model of monetization works. Mm. Looking through the lens of Disney, we actually see these as channels to really extend our stories. You know, uh, Disney being, being Disney, we're, we're an entertainment company. Mm. You know, we own uh, Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, and Pixar, the greatest stories in the world. Mm. And for us, it's really how can we use these mediums, you know, whether if it's subscription, whether through ads, whether through 
uh, in-app purchases or premium versions, uh, I, I think that's relative to the market that you're looking into. Mm. I think for us, it's really more of how we use these mediums to extend the stories, mm. you know, so that let's say we have a film, how can that story of the film live in consumer products, on TV, on uh, social media, as well as on games and apps. So what I, I, I hear I'm when you say this, Jay, yeah. just one second, just give me a second. <laughs> what I hear when you say this is with Disney, you're pretty sure that the yeah. dollar is going to come to your pocket somehow. So you don't really worry about how it does. As long as you tell the story, money will come to you. I, I'm sure for a brand like, uh, I, and I still can't pronounce it very well, Paca, Paca, Paca Alpaca, 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 right? Say how it do with you? Me, Paca, Alpaca, yeah. Alpaca. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. You know, uh, it's not just okay. You know, it's the brand and the money will come. Right? Hmm. It, it's also really looking into what type of audience you want to extend the stories with. So, hmm. for example, for kids. One of the key ingredients of Club Penguin, why it was so popular, is because it's secure. Mm. You know, it has safe chat, it has a patented safe chat technology. Mm. Uh, it has all of the hooks so that it's not, you know, being during that time around, you know, 2008, 2009, a lot of kids are going online. And you need, as a parent, you need a place for, for your kids to interact with other people in a safe environment, and, and, and Club Penguin gave that, you know, and that's where the innovation comes. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that there's only one Disney in this room, right? Most of the other companies are smaller, and so um, one, of the major, one of the major challenges that we have as small companies, and I, sp I hope I speak for all small discoverability. companies. Discoverability. It's, yeah, it's just, just making sure that we get into that. I mean, we don't have the marketing dollars, we just, how do we, and when we get the attention of the consumer, if they don't pony up fast, you know, we can it, die. You're right, so, it is twofold because first of all, it's, you know, how do, you know, getting into the app store and then getting a feature and you mm. can't rely on that because if you're not getting a feature, then no one knows you're there and especially as a new brand and you're a little late to market because, mm. you know, when Toka Boca entered the market, it was, you know, a bunch of years ago mm. and they, you know, they quickly stood out because their products are beautiful and, uh, and they built an audience and parents and families trust these products and Disney, you know, you have built in trust already with these brands. So, you know, how do we follow suit and how do we get noticed in the stores, you know, it's interesting because you know as I mentioned we're launching on other kids platforms mm. and um, one of these plat platforms is called Lamsa across the Middle East and just in you know less than a year a few of our videos achieved 4.3 million views I mean I know mm. I'm talking about videos and apps but it's still you know about building a brand and you know and we're the second brand after Sesame Street so wow. you know it's that's pretty incredible but our mm. apps are doing nothing mm. and you know that's just you know we're scratching our heads I talk about this a little bit later in my session but just really you know figuring out, you know, how do we get discovered in the app stores, and also how do you monetize? And, and you know, I'm learning so much at this conference about monetization, so it's been absolutely incredible. So Nickelodeon, Zan, um, how, what is Nickelodeon's main business model in this space? Um, I think with everyone else, it's the freemium and all that, but with Nickelodeon, you know, we have several strong IPs out there where we work with developers and publishers, and the developers would go in and take out and build the game, of course, with all our creative inputs and our creative guidance to make sure that, you know, the necessary, I guess, the necessary um, uh, gatekeepers are, not gatekeepers, the necessary uh, guidelines are met and to make sure that it's safe and parents approved, right? So maybe for us, the risk is slightly different where our developers would pay a certain kind of uh, MG for us, with us, in terms of that business model, but the responsibility is between us and the, and the developers to make sure that we help to promote uh, the app on the game store, on our platforms, uh, we help to push for the awareness and push the content forward. And that's where both of us will come in together to make sure that we are able to monetize and they're able to also recoup you know, the amount that they have uh, given us. Anybody has anything else to add? Yeah, so to just add to add on to that like, yeah. uh, as well. Um, so on, on the words of our chief creative officer, John Lasseter, around you know, quality is the best business model. Mm. I think, yes, brands is big, definitely. It take you so far. But I think what's exciting about the, the, the mobile space is that, you know, yes, brand can take you, take you so much, but you still have to make sure that your game, for example, for a game, 
your core game mechanic actually works. Mm. For e-learning, for example, uh, the, 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 what you're trying to convey to the kids actually makes sense. You know, for a kid in Vietnam versus a kid in South Dakota, for example. So, yeah. so actually, this was uh, one of the questions that I had here uh, that I really wanted to talk about. And, and we met, had different, different question, uh, words used from each of you uh, in your uh, individual responses, you know, you talked about uh, trust, uh, you know, you talked about care, you talked about, uh, you know, faith, like uh, winning the, 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 the respect and getting, getting them on board. So in what ways does developing games or content in general for children di differ from doing like general entertainment stuff? I could yes. okay, throw sure. some ideas around <laughs> as well. So um, basically to us, we think that the, the main difference between doing kids game and generic game is that uh, you are not going after only the players. You also have to take care about the parents because they're the one who eventually get to determine what game that the kids can play and pay eventually. So not only can you, uh, should you make a game interesting enough to keep the players engaged, but you also have to make the parents feel comfortable in letting their kids play in your game in a way that uh, ideally they should feel the kids should have something that they could take away after they play your game. Now, I think actually that's the main differences. And just to add on that, just to ensure that all the content is age appropriate, mm. and I'm sure you all do plenty of kid testing with um, with the kids and, and teachers and the parents. So that's really important because you know if it's age appropriate content, you know they can take it back out into the real world, just like you were saying. And um, it's all about retention. And also the most important thing is that you know the brand and the content is trusted and it's safe. So um, so one of my questions was, it, do you think that what what do you think is the biggest obstacle when approaching, um, you know, when you have a kid's product in hand, what's the biggest obstacle trying to get to the market? But I think that's something that is already getting addressed. We are, we're already talking about it. So can I get, like, from, uh, from Zan, from, can I get some insight from you for how Nickelodeon actually does this? You know, we talk about this idea of gaining the trust of the parents. How do you do that? How do you achieve that? Yes. Um, what I've mentioned earlier in my presentation this morning is that everything that Nickelodeon does, it always starts with our IP. So if you look at all the stores, um, a lot of the apps, it all derives from our original content, right? Mm -hmm. So from the very start, if you look at preschool content, where we are, you know, we've got a lot of very strong preschool properties, Pop Petrol being very hot and very trusted. Um, you know, we have shows like Blaze and the Monster Machine, which is focused on curriculum, the STEM curriculum, which is again parent approved and, you know, um, we work with a lot of research and all that. So from that, when we launched the show, we also launched a lot of other short form content that's attached to it, which kind of like re-emphasized on what the show is all about. Um, talking to the kids. At the same time, all our shows are, while it's talking to kids, it's also inviting parents to watch with the kids. So in that way, you build that bond and you build that trust element. And they expect to see that through, through the game development. So when game or apps are being developed, you know, uh, so it, it will be our responsibility to be working very closely with the developers to make sure that the brand essence of the show, the guidelines that we have around the show is met. And that way, that it stays true throughout the brand and throughout the entire process. Mm. And then when it comes to things like that, it's a lot easier for us to still go back to the parents to say, your child has seen this particular show and this is what the show you know, is all about. But at the same time, you know, now you can immerse, your kid and you can immerse in the game together by, you know, because they've really trusted the brand. So we build it up and it takes some time to build up. There are, t there are times when we launch the show and six months later the game come out, but we know that we put a lot of promotion behind it. We talk to a lot of various, uh, you know, parenting groups or various, you know, kids around the world and parents to make sure that they are aware of our shows and they are aware of, you know, the brand of what that brand is all about. Okay. So, Jay, uh, Disney is a family-friendly brand, right? So it's, it's very well known and, and, you know, whether you go to Disney World or you're going, walking to a Disney store or actually watching a Disney movie, there's something for most people. Um, one of the questions, and I, and, you know, I just wanted to sort of kind of figure out whether uh, the way you uh, approach this idea of dealing with the parents in a similar way that, you know, are you actively trying to include the parents in the activity? And what I want to do later, uh, Nicole and Simon, is I want to see if there is any kind of 
contrast in the way a smaller company approaches this than if, if how a larger company approaches this issue of trust. So would you want to tell me a little bit about how does Disney think of, how, how does Disney kind of actively, especially in apps, you know, we, we can't look at the entire brand in general, especially when you're designing apps, how do you make an app more inclusive for, I mean, I understand how you do it in a movie, I understand how you do it in an amusement park. How do you do that on an app? An app that's for a child, how, does, how do you make it more interesting for a parent? That's a very good uh, uh, question. Uh, for, for us, we try to ensure that every content that we release does not really take kids away from their parents. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it more so strengthen that bond. Uh, a couple of years ago, we actually launched this brand called Imagine Academy, mm -hmm. wherein uh, there is a strong parent component. There's actually a parent app, wherein you can see the progression of of, of the kids within the, within the Imagine Academy series of apps. Mm -hmm. So for example, within the app, if you created a rocket, for example, the parent can actually see that rocket you know, and get some form of uh, validation that, okay, you know, we've made the right choice, you know, we downloaded the right app, and you know, I'm seeing the progress of my kids. Mm -hmm. um, you, you see that as well, uh, as well across all of the, uh, you know, our, our initiatives within the kids' gaming space, you know, Club Penguin, if you're a kid, you cannot just register and play. And play. You know, if, if you're registering as a kid, you need a parent's um, uh, consent in order for you to get into the game and buy something, etc. Simon. Well, this is actually a very big question, hmm. and my answer is really a bit lengthy. So um, to answer the questions, I think it eventually comes down to the questions that uh, which parents are we targeting? So I think it will, if you look at the top chart on that mini, actually the kind of games you will come across in China will be substantially different from the games you come across in US. And uh, actually this, uh, the difference between these two countries will exemplify the difference between a lot of the game genre difference between the East and the West. So I take this as an example. So in China, basically if you look at the top chart, a lot of the games you can find there are actually more educational um, space. So for example, uh, currently the top one grossing game in Kids Bay in China is something called uh, Wukong Yangzi, which basically translates to uh, Monkey King Learn Chinese, which from the name of it you can tell actually is a game that gamifies the experience of Chinese uh, character learning being put into the context of a very rigorous uh, RPG uh, framework. And um, I think actually why the reason this kind of game uh, excel in China is because uh, of the underlying competitive Asian cultures. So as a parent, uh, because of the, such a competitive cultures, they want the kids to learn as much as possible when they are still early. So it would be ideal if they can find games which could on one hand entertain their kids and on the other hand, which could teach them something and benefit them uh, academically, then it would be the best case scenario. But then on, at the same time, if you look at the games in the Western market, like in US, uh, the kind of game you will come across is pretty much different. So in general, the kind of game you will come across in the United States is pretty much very diversified. So you have uh, entertainment games like Club Penguin Island, and you have uh, Noggin from Nickelodeon, which is a video streaming game. And you also have uh, the Epic, which is uh, reader apps. Uh, so actually, the diversity is much larger than that of what we see in Asia. And I think, uh, again, it also attributed to the fact that the Western education system focus more on uh, well-balanced educations. Uh, so uh, the parents uh, from the Western countries, they probably would like the kids to get exposed to different walks of life as early as possible to get them prepared when they grow up. So I think actually that's the concern and considerations that we will take into account when we're developing, we're developing the games. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so you covered actually China and, and the US yeah, yeah. in your answer. Uh, you do work, uh, Nicole, in uh, the Middle East as well as in Europe. Yes. So uh, what is your view of uh, you know, this? Uh... Well, as far as you know, building trust with parents, parents. again, you know, we're, we're still a relatively new brand. And we have to build trust, that's really important. And we're working from the ground up, so we're starting small. So we do so much kid testing with our products in the schools, at home. We've actually created a virtual group with lots of moms and their kids, and we send our products, our apps, our videos during development, uh, and you know, with a specific set of questions. Parents sometimes send back videos, and it's you know, it's a great way for us to have direct access to our audience, 
and, and we take all that feedback back very seriously. We take it on board. And, um, and also with our educational consultant, we make changes along the way. And as far as you know, reaching out to parents and building that trust, once we launch our products, we try to use social media. We try to promote ourselves at these conferences. Uh, we make sure that uh, all of our descriptions, all of our information on our website and the metadata, you know, we're just showing everyone that we're creating responsible content. And you know, again, it, it's just it's very challenging. And you know, when I uh, you know worked at Disney and I'm creating apps for you know Ben and Holly's Little Kingdom and Mr. Maker, I mean, it just it was such a different kettle of fish as far as you know reaching out to parents directly um, in terms of what we're doing now. But you know, we're seeing results because I'm still hearing from parents who are still playing the apps and. And as far as the actual content in the apps, where we want to encourage co-play with the parents, so um, so parents and kids are asking questions together, and uh, and you know, and having that experience. Okay, so uh, I, I wish you the best luck with this. Uh, you know, this I think this is something that all developers want to learn, uh, especially if you're going to be working in the children's space. Um, we, we are all trying to struggle to figure out how best to communicate with, uh, with parents. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have one more question. I'm just going to ask one more question from my list, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor, and, and, and I'm going to ask uh, people to give their questions. I'm, I'm sure they're eager to talk to you all as well. Uh, so here's, uh, here's, uh, here's the, 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 like, uh, the kicker, like uh, the, the, the most kind of hiddenly, deceptively simple question I put inside there. Uh, now I've, I've kind of uh, so <laughs> predict the future. What's 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 in the near horizon? What's in like two years from now, three years from now? What's going to do well in this particular space? So. I hope I get over my jet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what uh, what's going to do well in this in, uh, this particular market space? I mean, like we've got AR, we've got VR, we've got like oh, so much stuff happening. Um, what is the major innovation coming in the children's app space? Do you want to start that? Yeah. Sure. Um, from my perspective, uh, I, I think what's interesting, to probably just going back to my answer a uh, couple of questions back, looking into how the digital space is evolving, you know, with AR and VR and all of these new technologies coming up, mobile, you know, even like general connectivity in emerging markets is coming pretty strong, right? What's interesting there is that all of this is like new technology. So mm. there's no, no one who has the big pie of that technology. So, which means that everyone is on the same, same, same uh, starting line. And what's interesting about being all at the same starting line is that you can actually expect great content anywhere, mm. whether you're in, in, in developed markets or in, in emerging markets, in far-flung villages, you know, in, in the Philippines, in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of like, great developers in countries like in Bandung, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so what's interesting there is that, the diver that you know, we'll see a lot more diversification. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not one app, for example, or one way of, of monetizing, one way of, of, of you know, play. You know I'm not letting you off with that, right? So you're not going to talk about diversification and lots of things in the future. You're going to give me a prediction. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, like for, no, no. Because, because that's what you're seeing, right? Okay. If, if everyone's on the same line, hmm. then then everyone has a chance. Everyone has a voice. I think hmm. platforms like 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 Apple well, and Google have shown describing the that. state of the industry. I want you to give me a like an innovation, something new that's going to happen that's not happening already. It has. Oh, uh, Everyone's well, going to turn I, off their iPads and go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think for us, right? We were we the the market in general is very small, mm. right? Like the kids gaming market. Mm. Through diversification, through much more focus on relevancy and localization, you'll see. You know, we can ex we can expect, for example, that market to grow mm. only because all of these new mediums, all these new technologies are coming out. Mm. And people anywhere doesn't have a monopoly to it. You know, mm. people can actually create great content uh, and get it published or getting distributed globally. Mm. So, democracy. <laughs> Give me a, another prediction. Give me something to work with here. <laughs> well, I, I can say uh, I'm making any predictions, but from my own perspective, mm. I would really like to see how educations and gaming could be interweaved together more mm. tightly. Like, for example, aim 
Taiwan, actually some of the schools are already using quite a high-tech technologies in the classroom in which actually the uh, teachers can put up the question they want to ask the student on the screen and the student they have an individual iPad and then immediately after they answer the questions the uh, teachers can see the statistics of which student answer which questions and get to see what is the weakness and strength and of the individual student. I think actually it gives us some um, foreseeing of the future in terms of how gaming and also integration can be introduced together. Just like uh, uh, if you look at um, Minecraft EDU, actually it's rarely adopted in the West. And I think actually there's a lot of this area we can explore in the space. Uh, like for example, let, let, uh, talking about some of the things we've been doing recently, uh, we're working on, on a game that actually teach the children how to play a guitar, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they're actually playing like a tap-tap revolution kind of game with the real guitar. Mm -hmm. So I think actually there's some directions that we could help to propel the industry in a short term. Okay, so my, what I think, you know, there's definitely going to be a lot more content out there. So mm -hmm. what would that con how strong would that content be and how would we stand out across all the various clutters that, I mean, a lot of other titles out there. So I agree, education is, I think, one of the areas where there's going to be a lot more emphasis and focus, whether it's going to go into to schools or whether even with the kids themselves. So if you look at kids today, a lot of them spend a lot of time at creating things on their own, right? If you go to you know, any of the video portal site, you realise that there's a lot of kids who are trying and making new things. So I think it would be quite interesting to see how would kids uh, be involved in storytelling? How can they then take an original story, for example, and create their own stories and integrate that with an original story that then becomes their own, giving them that opportunity to be creating something that's original and theirs. And I think if, if that's something that you know, any of the developers can help to develop and bring to schools, I think from a teacher's perspective, it's also great because then from an education perspective, it's also great because then the teachers will allow the kids to let their creativity flow and, you know, and, and if it becomes successful, that too can take on to a different level. I don't have much to add to that other than at the end of the day, kids just want to have fun. Mm. You know, they want, you know, yes, the buzzwords, uh, learn in context, learn through play, but, you know, there's a reason why those are cliches and it's true. And also, you know, um, kids love characters mm. and they love stories. And I think, again, you know, if all these experiences um, integrate great characters, great stories, then, you know, you hook the kids, and especially if it's, you know, quality, age-appropriate content. So, just, uh, it's interesting, I don't know, um, if you, so I'm from the serious games industry, so <laughs> that's been my life for the past 15 years, we've been building games for schools and children, um, you know, in education, we've been working in, and we see ourselves as a completely different industry from the entertainment industry, so this is what I said, I'm a serious guy in a casual crowd, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but it's interesting, I'm like all of you uh, really think about this idea that education and, uh, and, and entertainment are going to come together more closely in the future. So with this, uh, let's ask uh, for some questions. I have a bunch of more questions that I would like to ask anyways, but um, if there are any questions in the crowd. Hi, sorry, just like to ask, usually how long uh, would a project's uh, uh, skill as in how long it would take and usually like what's the team size or of uh, people do you all usually look for as in uh, to create the, the apps that you all want? Okay, who would you like uh, to answer first? I'm like we're talking about Disney, Nickelodeon, I'm sure they have a completely different uh, uh, skill, you know. Uh. I mean, I'm sure that they, they, they do have like small games and then uh, they, they also uh, have games that they want to last maybe forever. They, hmm. Yeah, so like, but usually like how, how is that, like what, what is like usually the smaller games like yeah, uh, I mean, like where where small companies could actually get involved instead of big companies, okay. as in big developing companies. So, yeah. um, Simon, you want Animoca to answer this first, and then we can get uh, Nicole to uh, to talk about it, and then we'll work our way up to Disney. Sure. sure. <laughs> so, um, to answer your questions, basically, for a small smaller scale kids game, it will take somewhere between three to six months to develop, and uh, it usually involves uh, one engineer and a game designer and also an artist to, to, to be involved in these kind of projects. Nicole? Yeah, it's similar. And then, you know, our two apps, they were actually very large apps. And the first one, because we were also um, creating new assets, so we actually spent about, I think, seven or eight months on production. Mm -hmm. And then our second app, we were able to reuse a lot of the assets. Uh, 
but also we were um, localizing the audio in lots of different languages, but that one probably took a bit shorter, probably four or five months. Would it be fair to say that for the bigger brands, uh, you know, such as Nickelodeon and Disney, your project time schedules and the number of people who, you know, mm -hmm. you can spare for that app is larger? <laughs> Do you want to? <laughs> um, okay, so I, I think my, my, my main, the question that I, you know, that popped into my head when you asked that question is really, you know, it's not just about development, right? Uh, it's also about looking, okay, where are you going to publish it? Which platforms? Um, um, is it, uh, for example, is it a one-time premium title or is it uh, a, a free-to-play title and then you're planning to do like live operations and then there's going to be uh, co subsequent content updates? So I think it really depends on the type of game that you're currently looking at because, um, like, obviously, there's different opinions, right? There are you know, smaller teams that are very, very good that can really do the job. And then there are, there are big teams that can really do the job on a longer scale that can provide content updates, uh, that can provide live operations, etc. So I know it's, it's, it's kind of vague, but essentially, I think it scales quite, quite, quite rapidly depending on the kind of game or app that you're currently building. Hi. Um, is there any lesser known things about um, things developers should not do or include in games for kids. Okay. Do you have a? Do you want to ask a question to a specific person? You just want to ask um, it to the general. whole panel. Okay. In general. Okay. So, uh, things that developers should not do when developing games for kids. So gambling is one, but let's. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for Disney, besides our very very stringent ad guidelines mm -hmm. uh, and brand guidelines, uh, there's an added component around different local government regulations. So for example, COPA compliance, that's very big in the US. We're a US company, so we need to adhere to that. Um, again, you know, looking into this, you need to be very, very careful around even like little things like the type of, 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 of game, you know, that you're trying to, 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 to show. You know, that, that, that's why, for example, there's an ESRB rating, for example, for, for serious games, right? Uh, there is, a, a very stringent amount of regulations, uh, whether if it's on graphics, on gameplay, on monetization, on, on marketing that you can use, uh, that you can do for uh, pushing, uh, for developing, publishing, and marketing uh, games for kids. Yeah. I just want to add on the production side, first of all, as I mentioned before, you need to do so much kid testing because if you don't do kid testing and you just, you're not quite sure how kids will respond and if, you know, if a button is not placed correctly for whatever reason and a kid is locked on a screen mm. and they feel lost, they will literally walk away. I mean, you really have to do tons of kid testing and also QA testing at the end. As we all know, at the end of production, we're all exhausted and we just want to get that app to the market but you need to do so much QA because again, it's all about quality control and you, you, know, you want to know that your product is trusted and it's the best it can be. So Nicole, one, don't do. We have, the question is, you I'm shouldn't do. I'm turning it around <laughs> into a positive. I'm that kind of person. <laughs> no, let's, let's, let's give the man a don't do, Simon. Okay, what so, should you not do? <laughs> um, you should not assume uh, the kids will behave uh, as what the adults do. Ah, so okay. that means that, uh, for example, when you're designing the tutorial, do not assume they know where to press. So you basically have to run a lot of tests, as what Nicholas has just said. Mm -hmm. And um, on the other hand, actually, what you should do is that you should actually identify very clearly what is your age group target audience. Because what uh, appeals to a two years old boy doesn't necessarily appeal to a one year old boy because the kids actually start to recognize shape and color at the 18 months. So actually that's something you should consider. I agree. I think I wanted to mention that what's very important is whatever that you're creating in the kids space is really for kids. Mm. So it's very important for you to know your audience you know the behavior of the kids and again when you talk about kids like what Simon mentioned the preschoolers between your two to six even between that age group there's differences between each bracket like your two to three three to four and five to six and then you have your six to fourteen which is also a very broad group so you really need to know when you you really need to understand your audience and really know your kids and really observe you know how they consume content and and look at the developmental stage and all that because I think that's really really important 
So actually, I have. Uh, I want to slip in one of my own questions here before. Have we take another question from the uh, from the floor? Uh, and this was the question. The idea was, uh, you know, within the children's games category, what the subcategories are. We I think kind of kind of addressed that with age groups. But other than age groups, and you know, are there any some very distinct categories, um, subcategories that you can be developing for? I'm like other than just children. Are there other very distinct subcategories that that exist in this market space? In the app stores. Yeah. Family and kids, education. Mm. That's that's. No. Uh, so let's just talk about genres. That then you know what kind of games would we do? So we've got educational on one side. Um, you know, has anybody tried a non-educational children's game? Well, I mean, our games are educational in terms that there is an underlying, you know, uh, curriculum compatibility. But uh, you know, again, we just we want to make sure that our games are fun. So um, you know, we do. Uh, Again, using a buzzword, edutainment. Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's um, what we're trying to achieve with um, with our apps and our videos. What, what about one of the bigger companies? I mean, have you uh, seen or, or, or seen a brand, uh, a game within your brands that isn't titled or wouldn't be categorized as edutainment in general and just be pure entertainment? Do you think that as a category exists within? Uh... Uh, so for us, Club Penguin. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's not. It, it, it's really geared towards. Uh, Providing a safe community, a safe haven for kids, where they can meet other kids and just hang out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was the that, that was the key formula that, that made it very successful back in you know late 2000s. We this year we launched Club Penguin Island. You know, getting all of the great stuff that we had with Club Penguin Classic, and then move that into reimagine that in the mobile space, mm -hmm. and that's where you get Club Penguin Island. So. Mm -hmm. So for us, actually, we, we are um, trying to experiment with quite a lot of um, uncommon genres on our side as well. Like, apart from the music learning apps that we've just mentioned, we are also doing this, uh, what we call the Kids Fitness app. Meaning that, uh, because seeing the success of Pokemon Go, there's a mm. lot of children that are playing with parents. They go down to the street and catch Pokemon. And um, also, according to, to WHO, actually there are more than 40 million kids which are overweight in the world. So we think that actually this is a huge market, an untapped market which we can actually break into. So we basically uh, did a game called um, Garfield Fit, which basically uses the characters of Garfield, and then they, uh, their mission is to go down the street and walk uh, specific miles uh, a day to accomplish different missions and catch different uh, kind of items to decorate the afters. So it's also somewhat of an entertainment, but it's not really um, intellectual entertainment, but it's more like a, a physical uh, entertainment apps yeah. for us. Actually, kids fitness app is completely the kind of thing that I was wanting to go for when we, we talked about this. Do you have something to add? I think fitness app for kids is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I get another question? Uh, what, do you, what would be the criteria of partners that you guys are looking for? What's going to stand out uh, for these guys to be able to look to aspire to words? That's interesting. Yeah. For us, we've had several um, experiences with working with developers and, and where we would like the developers to also help us is to look at how they could publish in various markets uh, and not be too dependent on us. Um, I mean, the idea is we will definitely come in to support, but then, you know, we would also expect, uh, you know, as a developer or you have partners uh, to help publish, you know, the game, uh, that would be really helpful for us. Key pillars, uh, Disney's key pillars um, uh, in the region is really around storytelling, uh, innovation, and localization. So whenever we look for key partners that can deliver, uh, you know, whenever we look for, for partners, we look for partners who can deliver these. You know, how can, you know, if, if key traits that the studio should have is that should really be strong in storytelling, uh, something innovative, you know, it, it, it can't be, okay, it's the same, it's a copycat of this game that's already successful, etc. And then localization. So uh, us here in Southeast Asia, we're very, very focused on how can we increase relevancy of our stories uh, through mediums like games. So if we, ca if we have an idea, you know, if, if we can receive ideas, for example, around, okay, how can this certain mechanic or how can this certain opportunity bring our stories much more closer to kids in the Philippines, to kids in Vietnam, for example, then we're happy to, to explore. 
What about you? Are you guys? Well, we do all of our own development, and um, but as far as uh, branching out into the educational sector in emerging markets, which I mentioned before, it's really learning more about these markets, and you know whether that information comes from developers or educators, and 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 so on. You know that's um, that's a big area that we're currently exploring. Well, uh, we're actually also working with third-party developers, so we actually uh, work with them as a publishers. But then, um, in our criteria, uh, we believe most of the kids game developers, especially the indie ones, they do, they are involved in this space because they they want to create a better better futures. Although it's a cliche, but I think it's the truth. So I think instead of um, having a lot of hard requirement for them, uh, our requirement is they should essentially share the same futures as we do. So basically, we want to create a brighter futures where the kids can learn and grow in a fun way. I think that's the most important thing when we are considering a partner. Okay. So um, I, I think we're going to run out of time soon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, um, uh, I'm going to give everybody a couple of minutes. Uh, what I want to know is something exciting and upcoming that we should all look out for that's coming from uh, you know, your, your studio that's hopefully something not published yet, or if it's published, maybe it's something that you need, that you want, should, uh, you know, more people to share and, and, and see, so uh, can we start? Uh, yeah, we will so go this way, so we'll go with, uh, you know, Simon, sure. you start, then Nicole, then Zan, then Jay. Sure, so um, in terms of something um, exciting upcoming in the kids space, what I can tell is that uh, the kids game market has grown to a size that is estimated to make uh, around 2.2 billion this year. And if we look at some of the top performers, um, like ABC Mouse, they're making around uh, 100 million US dollars a year, which if you talk to Supercell, of course, is, they might look dynamic because they're making around a couple of 10 times more than that. But to us as a small company, we are more than happy to see the numbers. <laughs> so that's actually extremely good. And on the other hand, actually, uh, set aside for the mobile gaming, uh, if you look at the toys market, actually it grossed a total of more than 90 billion US dollars last year, which is twice as much as what we see on the mobile gaming market. And because of the fact that actually the players, the children essentially, they are uh, spending more and more time on the screen. So I believe that these 90 billion US dollars will eventually, sooner or later, flow to the reservoir of the kids mobile game market. And I see a bright future because of that. Okay, awesome. No, I, uh, so that's an interesting observation. Something interesting coming up from your own studio, something new. Uh, so f on our side, actually, we are doing quite a lot of news of, like, for example, the fitness game, and also the music game is actually what we are focusing on currently as well. So um, as I said, we actually are trying to do this music game in a way that uh, kids can learn music in an interactive way. Because we see that actually there's a lot of parents nowadays, they put the kids in this music class. And the problem is, actually, that these classes are usually very expensive. In Hong Kong... So what is it called? I'm just sorry. Uh, it's called Monster Court. It's called Monster Court, the game of Monster Court. Monster Court. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of cute guitar-looking monster. They will teach you how to play chords. So cool. that's Monster <laughs> Court. Yeah. So basically, going back to the problem is um, uh, the music class itself is actually very expensive. In Hong Kong, it will cost somewhere around a couple of ten to hundred US dollars per hour. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, most of the time, actually, it will be not the extremely uh, engaging experience for the kids as well. Because especially when they're still a, a music beginner, they have to gone through all the Duremi so over and over again just to familiarize themselves with the instrument. So with, um, with the development of this game, we're aiming to provide them with an interactive experience so that they can be most engaged when they're playing and learning together with this bunch of uh, cute-looking guitar monsters. Yeah. There you have it, folks. Monster Chord. It's one of the things that you got to look it up. I'm going to be looking it up soon. Nicole, what's uh, right. new and so exciting and upcoming? On the horizon for Paca Alpaca. Yeah. Well, we're actually working on a collaboration in Saudi Arabia, and we're hoping to um, create culturally specific content um, for the preschool market. And so, yeah, that's actually now in the works. We're really excited about that, and, and also creating culturally specific content. And uh, I know this is about apps, but on the video side, because we are picking up steam with our videos, um, because PACA travels around the world, we're in the process of creating um, a video where PACA learns about um, the celebration of Eid. And we also did a celebration of the Chinese New Year. So we're heading more in that direction. And again, if we can circle back around and integrate that kind of content into our apps, we would absolutely love that. So yeah, lots of different plans so, uh, on the horizon. What is one app you recommend everybody to come to know the brand with? So I love our, our travel. <clears throat> excuse me. 
our Travel Playtime app. It's it's a lovely app. It's um, lots of fun, snackable activities like jigsaws and dot to dot. It's just you know, very um, uh, appropriate for our preschoolers. But the end of each activity, um, the child learns the flag from the, um, a particular country, and awesome. it's just so much fun um, hearing the kids, you know, shout out the names. Of the what was it called? What's it called? Paca Alpaca Travel Playtime. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, Thank, you. Sorry, thank you. Today in my early session when I was doing the, uh, in my morning session, I had mentioned about Spongebob Game Station mm. that we've launched in March. So if you have not downloaded the, the game, um, please go to you know, the Apple stores and the Android stores to download and install. It's really an interesting game. And, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and well, there's some, you said something that's new, right? So <laughs> that's new. Uh, so don't forget to download them. Uh, there's a lot of various games and it gets uh, refreshed a few, every, every few months, you know, so you get different kind of games uh, at, one, at one go. Um, Give us a little hint of what this is. It's, uh well, it's a, it's a game station, so uh, it houses all various Spongebob games mm. uh, in one particular app. Mm. So, for example, right now we've just launched the Spongebob Run app. So, Spongebob Run in Bikini Bottom, Jump, Slide and <laughs> stuff like that. So, it's pretty interesting. So, don't forget to download and install. Um, what's coming up for us uh, is uh, we, will, we have another app called the Nick Play, Nickelodeon Play app and the Nick Jr. Play app that's coming up. Um, and in, this app is really exciting. The Nickelodeon Play app won an, Emmy, uh, an award for it. Um, it is it houses all our content from long form, short form, uh, videos, games, and there's a lot of surprise elements in the game. So from a kid's perspective, as they go through and slide, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the app, um, there is some buttons. For example, we have a do not touch button. And kid being kids, because they're curious, you tell them not to do something, they'll do something. So they'll touch the button and then something surprising will come out. So that's also available. And if you're in Singapore, you can download it. If you're Singaporean and with uh, Singtel, just download it and uh, try it. Uh, we're going to be launching that in Indonesia uh, very soon. And then Nick Jr. Play app is also coming up. Um, almost a similar approach as Nick Play, but this time around, the elements in Nick Jr. Play is a lot more targeted to the preschoolers. Awesome. Okay. So for, for us, um, the big, if, if you haven't downloaded it yet, please try uh, Club Penguin Island. Mm -hmm. uh, we launched it uh, a few months ago, a couple of months ago, uh, still new. Um, and it's really reimagining Club Penguin Classic into the mobile mobile space, so, okay. yeah. Um, I actually wanted to ask, there are many kids apps on, you know, the app stores. Uh, how do you actually promote the app to kids? I mean, a lot of the times, I think parents are the gate holders, but I'm sure kids also would download. How, how do you promote them? And that, this is targeted, at, you know, across the whole panel. Okay, so here this question is, I mean, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about parents and teachers and building trust, and so the audience is not impressed. They want to know, how do you get to the kids? So. <laughs> I've always been pointing to you first. Why don't you go first, Nicole, this time? Oh, so unfair. That's a really hard question as the last question. You know, it, it's, as I mentioned before, it's like working from the ground up, going into the schools, testing the game with the kids directly. It's word of mouth, and you just really need to spend time with kids. Mm. And, you know, and this way they get to know your products, they play your games, they love your character. So from you know, our perspective, that's how we promote our products to the kids. Mm. Yes, everybody watches the channel, but <laughs> how, do you, how do you catch well, we, on? Of course, we use our own platforms, and mm. we also have, you know, we also work with other platforms. So on our own platforms, we promote it on our channels, we promote it on our website, <laughs> on our social media pages, <laughs> and at every opportunity, whenever we have an event, you know, we make sure that there we allow sampling, so kids can come to the event and sample the game and get them to download the game. Um, in any kind of print activities that we do, we make sure that we also mention about the app. So at mm. every platform available will use to promote it. So if you want exposures, you should definitely get Mickey Mouse and SpongeBob. <laughs> That's the fastest way ever. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't think you need to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so uh, if there is no more questions, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for being here and uh, being such good sports. and. Uh, um, and talking about uh, your companies and, uh, and what you're planning to do. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you.